right, so looking at some of the political history with India, we already talked about the Harappans. We had the three major Harappan cities. They had very advanced, sophisticated city planning and plumbing and all that good stuff. And eventually they abandoned their cities and nobody really knows why. When they leave the cities, they, they're basically kind of split into lots of small villages. That's when the Aryans come in. The Aryans are described as Indo-European, so they're coming from the direction of Europe, probably through the Khyber Pass, through the Hindu Kush Mountains, and they fundamentally change Indian culture and the way the society works. Now, following that period, some history books call that the Vedic period, but we can think of it as, as when the Aryans are basically kind of settling into the country. We have the beginnings of the Indian empires. Chandragupta Maurya is the founder of the Mauryan Empire, which is considered by many historians to be the greatest empire in Indian history. He conquers a lot of territory. He had a huge army, over 300,000 foot soldiers, over 9,000 elephants, took a lot of taxes in order to feed and take care of that many troops. Okay, so Chandragupta Maurya he founds the Mauryan Empire. Okay, Maurya, Mauryan Empire. A lot of these names are going to be very similar. Now, while he conquers almost the entire Indian subcontinent, he does not conquer southern India, and neither do the Guptas later. The Tamil people are the ones in southern India. And they are socially very different from everybody else in the Indian subcontinent because the Tamil people have a matriarchy, which means that the women are basically dominant in the society. It's the mother figure who is head of the family, for example. While the rest of India, like most of the societies we're going to study this year, was a patriarchy, meaning that the father is the head of the family. It's the eldest men who basically run everything. All right. Now, Chandragupta Maurya had an advisor named Katilya who basically helped him be as ruthless as possible. Um, Chandragupta Maurya had spies throughout his empire um, ratting people out who were, you know, trying to form conspiracies. He was, he got really paranoid as he got older about assassination plots. We talked about him having food tasters to make sure he wasn't being poisoned and, and sleeping in different bedrooms all the time. His son took over after he abdicated the throne. Um, his son, not really a major ruler. It's his grandson that is the next important person you need to know. Ashoka. Sometimes you see his name spelled just with an S, sometimes with an SH. Same guy. Ashoka, Chandragupta Maurya's grandson. Very important. Now, um, Ashoka fought a lot of battles, gained a lot of territory, but he started to feel really guilty about all the people who were dying in the name of conquest. And after a lot of soul searching, he converts to Buddhism and he decides that he's going to change the way he's running the entire empire. He does a lot of things that, that are very different from what his grandfather did. He adopts the motto, peace to all beings. He puts rock pillars, sometimes these are called the rock, the rock edicts, and edict is a government pronouncement or order. Um, but these rock pillar edicts are put all over the kingdom. Um, and they have Buddhist scriptures and scenes from Buddha's life, trying to remind people about how Ashoka wanted them to live and how they should treat each other. He was not by any means trying to make everybody convert to Buddhism. Because he was a proponent of religious toleration or religious tolerance, where you let people believe what they want. Hinduism and Buddhism do have an awful lot in common because they do come from that same shared history. Okay? Um, but Ashoka did a lot of things to show that he took his subjects into consideration. We talked about the system of roads that he had built. Um, every nine miles there were wells dug with rest houses for people as they're traveling to make their lives easier. Something else that was done during Ashoka's reign 
was stupas were built in different places along the, uh, the roads, different parts of the empire. A stupa is a mounded earth structure over the top of a Buddhist relic. And again, this is just another way to show respect for the religion. Now, after Ashoka's reign, things basically fall apart, and you have a power vacuum created. Now, what a power vacuum is, is like you have somebody who's really, really powerful, and they disappear. And suddenly, all of these other people kind of get sucked into fighting for power. Okay, that's what makes it a vacuum. Um, as a result of this, you have a long period of civil war without anybody really being in charge. Eventually, that's going to change, and you're going to have the beginnings of the Gupta dynasty. I think that's good. This has been a Sleepy Bulldog production.